the mystic lovers of Persia, L. Adams Beck. It is impossible, though I have purposely avoided dealing with the philosophies of the Nearer East, to avoid the Sufi philosophy of Persia, partly because the Persians are a distinguished branch of the ancient family from which we and they alike descend, but still more because they had gazed into the same great mirror as the originators of the earliest Vedas and had carried with them in their own wanderings a dimmer conception of that light. This is seen in the teachings of their prophet Zoroaster. I have not written of this religion and its sacred book, the Avesta, for neither can really lay claim to the title of philosophy, and high and ennobling as are the moralities, the framework is so Vedic that the distinctions are scarcely of importance except to the Oriental scholar. The languages of the Veda and Avesta are more closely related to each other than are any other languages of the allied races, and may be described as dialects of the same tongue. For those who wish to study Zoroastrianism and the still more interesting worship of Mithra, a Vedic sun god, which at first bid fair to conquer Europe, and I strongly recommend the study of both, the names of useful books are given in the bibliography. Nor do I enter into Mohammedan thought save in its development among the Sufis. But if a book on earth deserves study by those who are interested in religion and social organization, it is the Koran, that great protestation of the unity of God. As a philosophy, it scarcely counts. It burns on, a fiery comet, to one end only. But since it is a faith of which much more will be heard in the future, especially as Africa develops her savage or semi-savage races, it should be known and respected. In the name of the merciful and compassionate God, say, He is God alone, God the Eternal. He begets not and is not begotten, nor is there anyone like to him. It throbs like the roll of war drums, but in Persia, springing from the root of Islam like a rose set with thorns, came an astonishing development, that of a passionate mysticism evolving into a philosophy that was to influence the life and art of Persia, and, through Persian culture at the court of the Mughal emperors, the Indian conception of art and its relation to life in a very high degree, the Sufism of Persia. Islam invading Persia had narrowed the Persians. It is a creed fenced with steel. They could not wholly assent to the most daring flights of the Vedanta, but in the close association of the two countries, it was perceived that here was a conception which would modify the stern Semitic belief in a governing Oriental sovereign, an Allah extreme to mark what is done amiss, slow to pardon, ruthless in justice. They had learned from India that the gods may be transcended. Indeed, Mohammedanism had led them thus far on the path. But Islam had not formed its own spirit, its central point of junction, where the divine and man meet and blend in a love transcending the attitude of ruler and subject, or father and son, and presenting a union only to be symbolized in that of the lover and beloved. This is a most interesting chapter in the history of thought and that of Mohammedanism. Sufism became a philosophy of life which reacted profoundly on the literature and art of Persia, producing such diverse fruits as the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and the impassioned lyrics of Jalaluddin and of Akbar's great poet Faisi. In no study of Asiatic thought can it be neglected, if it were but for its influence upon India. The word Sufi is differently derived. Some trace it to Suf, wool, a cloth used by early Islamic penitents, some to Sufi, wise, pious, some to Safi, pure. Possibly the likeness of the word to all three decided its choice. It connotes a high mysticism. The doctrine of the Sufis is that the human psyche differs infinitely in degree, but not at all in kind from the divine. It is an atom in that infinite whole in which it will eventually be absorbed. They hold that God is immanent in spirit and in substance in the universe, and that the only real love in the universe is that which relates us with that perfection, all other love being a dream to vanish at dawn. Eternity has neither beginning nor end. Its aim is bliss. Nothing exists in reality but mind or spirit. Material substances, as the world calls them, are illusion, 
the false mirror of the passing show. Therefore, nothing is worth a moment's consideration but the love which unites us to the bridegroom of the soul. And even in this illusory and miserable separation from the beloved flashes of heavenly beauty and memories of divine love, entrance us and remind us of forgotten truths. To quote an English poet of these visitings and instincts, it may be said, Hearken, O oh hearken, let your souls behind you. Turn gently moved, our voices feel along the dark to find you, O oh lost beloved. The yearning to a loveliness denied you shall strain your powers. Ideal sweetnesses shall overglide you, resumed from ours. In all your music, our pathetic minor, your ears shall cross, and all good gifts shall remind you of diviner. With sense of loss, Christianity and the new Platonism of Alexandria, which influenced the Gospel of St. John, contributed their streams to the river of this passionate devotion and it reacted upon the Moslems of India also in an ecstasy that produced there a form of Sufism, resulting not only in a passionately beautiful form of verse, but also in art of which exquisite examples may be seen among the Mughal paintings. Strangely, and yet why strangely, the first famous Sufi was a woman, Rabia, who died a century and a half after the beginning of the Moslem era. Story after story is told of her ecstatic passion for the adored, spiritual indeed, yet carrying the body onward with it, like a flower born on the bosom of a mighty torrent. She declared that she reached God by losing in him all else that she had found, crying aloud that she yearned to see God, to draw nearer, nearer by any means. She was answered by the voice in her heart, O oh, Rabia! Have you not heard that when Moses desired to see God, only a mote of the divine majesty fell on a mountain and scattered it in fragments? Be content, therefore, with my name. Asked by what means she had attained this intimate knowledge, she answered, Others know by certain ways and means, but I without ways, without means. A moth, indeed, consumed in the flame of the divine. When in sickness two famous theologians came to her bedside, the first said gravely, He is not sincere in prayer, who does not patiently endure castigation. And the second, How can he be sincere in prayer, who does not rejoice in suffering? But Rabia broke forth, radiant. How can he be sincere, who seeing the Lord does not forget all chastisement? This spirit was to blossom and fruit in the music of Saadi, Rumi, and Jalal Uddin. Poetry was to dye her wings in celestial fires, was to soar so near the sun as to terrify those who still walked on earth and preached the doctrine that an enthroned deity must be approached only with awful fear and reverence. And there was another fear also, sometimes justified, that this passionate flood of erotic symbolism and allegory might carry the body to earthly joys rather than the soul to those inhabiting the paradise not built with hands, eternal in the heavens. But nothing could stay the ardour of the Sufis. Their love was a torrent. Glory be to him who has removed from our eyes the veil of externals of form and confusion. The fakirs of India are descendants of these men, and in the nearer east the dervishes, a word which signifies poor, performing their giddying whirlings, are all that are left to represent that jubilant outrush of soul and spirit to the divine, which made great saints, great poets in Persia and India. They owned that what they had seen and experienced was beyond all human speech. In an image of Sardis, the flowers which a lover of the one had gathered in the garden of paradise so dizzied him with their fragrance that they fell from his hand and faded. How could he share them with others? How could he tell in words what he had seen? Jalal Uddin, the writer of that famous book, The Mesnavi, said of it, This book contains strange and rare stories, lovely sayings and profound indications, a way for the holy, a garden for the pious. It holds the roots of the faith and treats of the mysteries of certain knowledge. 
The miracle of this conquering love is that Islam, so hard and austere in its approach to a hard and austere master, accepts this spiritual book as second only to the Quran. That Muhammad would have approved these later developments is impossible to suppose. He dwelt much on the outward aspects of the faith and slightly on the inward. Think on the mercies of Allah, not on his essence, was his teaching. The Sufis, however, evolved what may be called a code of their own. This can be used in interpreting many of the Persian poets and restoring the inner meaning of much verse. It sets in their true light as mystics, some poets whose fame has reached the West. They were men drunken with the wine which whoso drinks desires more, even to infinity. They were God-intoxicated, and not with wine. In this code, sleep means deep meditation. Perfume the indication of the divine presence. Kisses and embraces are the mystic union of divine love. Idolaters are not the infidels, but men who in a lower stage of evolution do not recognize the one imminent presence, and who take Allah for the personal God and sovereign creator with whom Christians are familiar in the Jewish Old Testament. Wine means spiritual knowledge, intoxication, ecstasy. The wine cellar is the spiritual guide, in India, the guru, and the tavern is the cell where the seeker becomes drunken with the drink divine. Beauty is the perfection of the divine. Tresses are the expansion of his glory, and the lips of the beloved are his inscrutable mysteries. The black mole on the cheek of the beloved stands for the point of perfect union. For the black mole on the cheek of my beloved, I would give the cities of Bokhara and Samarkand. Throughout Asia, with the exceptions of China and Japan, the love of man and woman is the symbol of perfect union with the divine, the mystic state, where each is both. But only a symbol, for in human love there is always something which cannot be attained, some last unconquered peak of perfect amalgamation, whereas in the philosophy of the Aryan Asiatic races, and indeed in that of the Western mystics, the union is so transcendent, so absolute, that man, having recognized his oneness with the divine, tastes perfection. I am that, says the Indian mystic philosophy, and no mystic East or West, but echoes the cry of bliss. Barrow, the well-known English divine, sums up the philosophy of the Sufis, as though he had been one of them. I condense. Love is the sweetest and most delectable of all passions, and when by the conduct of wisdom it is directed in a rational way towards a worthy object, it cannot do otherwise than fill the heart with ravishing delight. Such, in all respects, superlatively such, is God. Our soul, from its original instinct, verges toward him and can have no rest until it be fixed on him. He alone can satisfy the vast capacity of our minds and fulfil our boundless desires. He cherishes and encourages our love by sweet embraces. We cannot fix our eyes upon infinite beauty. We cannot taste infinite sweetness without perpetually rejoicing in the first daughter of love to God, charity towards men. Here East and West certainly meet. It is the belief of the Sufi, as of many mystics, that such contact sets the soul above the earthly law of good and evil. This does not mean that this or any philosophy will permit a man to imbrute himself, but simply that he whose soul is exhaled into the divine, as the sun drinks up a dewdrop, is no longer subject to what may be called the Ten Commandments, for he forgets and transcends them, being lost in that love of the divine, which can inspire nothing but passionate longing to resemble its object. His every instinct walks the divine way. In this spirit, the Christ dissolves the ten prohibitive commandments into the two affirmative ones, the love of God, the love of man. For whoso walks in that light has outpaced the law of prohibitions. There is a fine translation by Fitzgerald, the translator of Omar Khayyam, of Salaman and Absal, by the Persian poet Jamie, which expresses the conception that all earthly love and beauty are rays of this sun. That men suddenly dazzled lose themselves, 
in ecstasy before a mortal shrine, whose light is but a shade of the divine, not till thy secret beauty through the cheek. Of Layla smite doth she inflame Majnun, for loved and lover are not but by thee, nor beauty, mortal beauty, but the veil, thy heavenly hides behind, to thy harm individuality. No entrance finds, no words of this and that. Do thou my separate and derived self, Make one with thine essential. Leave me room on that divan which leaves no room for twain. Yet in these beautiful words, the student of the Vedanta sees one great difference between the two philosophies. Jamie speaks of his separate and derived self. That position the Vedanta cannot acknowledge. There is no separate or derived self. Sufism postulates the approach to God and the passionate union with his perfection as of the lesser drawn by a magnet to the greater and henceforth clinging to it indivisibly. In the Vedanta philosophy, man has but to open the eyes of his soul to know that he was, is, and shall be divinity itself, one and indivisible, not dividing the substance, if such a word as substance may be used. In Sufism, the attitude is that of the unity of a perfect marriage, husband and wife, who in Homer's great words are of one mind in a house. In the Vedanta, there was one, there is one, and but one. Mohammedanism needed this high conception to soften its masculine austerity. It is the garden of God that blossoms on the rocks of the mountain. It may be lamented that this spirit has not persisted and that it does not consistently inspire the Quran. Had it done so, the deep cleavage between Moslem and Vedantic thought in India might to a certain extent have been bridged. It is interesting to consider the experience of Ibn al-Farid, an Arab born in Cairo in 1182, for it appears to coalesce with the Vedantic law of Shankara and also with some European feeling after the supernormal modes of expression. I refer the reader to Professor James's Varieties of Religious Experience. Ibn al-Farid finds three modes. First, normal experience, which he calls sobriety. This is the common experience of man as distinguished from the consciousness of plant or animal life. Next, what he calls intoxication, the state of God, possession, and the high rapture that follows realization of the divine. Both these are normal though distinguished in degree. The third state is induced by intoxication, but intoxication does not always produce it. This third state is the state now called cosmic consciousness, which Ibn al-Farid names the sobriety of union. This naturally is rare. In it, as in a mystical, tranquil, luminous perception, the soul is wholly united with God. As Mr. Nicholson puts it, the mystic in the first stage is aware of himself as an individuality distinct in humanity from divinity. In the second, every distinction between creator and creature has vanished. In the third, he is aware of himself as one with the creator. In the famous poem of Ibn al-Farid, he writes from this deific point of perception. There is no speaker but tells his tale with my words, nor any seer but sees with the sight of mine eye, and no listener but hears with my hearing, nor of any but grasps my might. And in the whole creation there is none but myself that speaks or sees or hears. Here is the absoluteness of the divine nature realized in the passing away of the human nature. For the writer speaks of himself as God. There is a mystic of the Sufi order whose perception took so high a form that it must be remembered in any record of the mystic philosophic side of Islam. An artisan, a wool carder, and hence called Halaj, he was credited with supernormal powers, and because of what was considered heresy by orthodox Muslims, was tortured to death in the year 309 of Mohammed. I am God, he cried and devout Muslims were unable to attain these higher ranges of philosophy. That fatal sentence occurs in his book The Kitab al-Tawasin, which sets forth his teaching and exercised undying influence in Islam. I am he whom I love, and he whom I love is I. We are two spirits dwelling in one body. If you see me, you see him, and seeing him, you see us both. 
Strangely, it is in Jesus, not in Muhammad, he sees the representative of God, and still more singular, he sees in Iblis, the Satan of Islam, a witness to the divine unity. In the Quran, it is told that Allah bid the angels worship Adam. Iblis, then named Azazel, refused, I am more excellent than he, thou hast made me of fire and him of clay. And Satan, or Iblis, was cast into hell, even as the emperors Akbar or Jehangir might have cast him into torture, for Allah is a true oriental sovereign. But Halaj relates that Iblis cried aloud to Allah, Wilt thou not behold me whilst thou art punishing me? And Allah answered, Yes. Then, said Iblis, do unto me according to thy will. Thy beholding me will destroy all consciousness of punishment. Such is love. And elsewhere, being reproached for disobedience as regards Adam, Iblis answers, It was no command but a test, a test of his unswerving devotion to the divine. Therefore, Halaj makes Iblis declare, Even in refusing to obey thee, I glorified thee. And he continues, My friends and teachers are Iblis and Pharaoh. Iblis was threatened with hell fire and yet did not recant. How could he adore any but God? Pharaoh was drowned, yet did not recant, for he would not acknowledge anything between him and Allah. And I, though I am killed and crucified, and my hands and feet cut off, I do not recant. Yet, it is interesting to observe how imperfect appreciation of the heights which may be scaled as in the Vedanta flung even a translucent soul, such as that of Halaj, into the old dilemma of free will. He writes, God cast man into the sea with his arms tied behind his back, and said to him, Take care, take care, lest thou be wetted by the water. This will remind all of Omar Khayyam's sad statement of the same cruel difficulty. O thou, who man of baser earth didst make, and even with paradise devise the snake, for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. It was natural that orthodox Islam could bear no such heresy. The man must die. Love, however, led Halaj through the maze. I cannot understand, I love, might have been his watchword. Thus it is told, when Hussein Ibn Mansur al-Halaj was brought to be crucified and saw the cross and the nails, he laughed so greatly that tears stood in his eyes. He knelt on the prayer carpet of a friend and recited the Fatiha, the profession of faith, and a verse of the Quran, and then prayed a prayer so remarkable that though his friend remembered it only in part, it should be remembered universally. I beseech thee to make me thankful for the grace bestowed in concealing from the eyes of others what thou hast revealed to me of the splendours of thy radiant countenance, which is formless, and in making it lawful for me to behold the mysteries of thine inmost conscience which thou hast made unlawful to other men. And these thy servants, who are gathered to slay me in zeal for thy religion, pardon and have mercy upon them. For in truth, if thou hadst revealed to them what thou hast revealed to me, they could not have done what they have done. And if thou hadst hidden from me what has been hidden from them, I should not have suffered this tribulation. Glory to thee in whatever thou dost and willest. They did him to death with tortures impossible to relate, and so befell what he had spoken of to a friend. And how will it be with thee, O Ibrahim, when thou seest me crucified and killed and burnt, and that day the happiest of all the days of my life? The friend was speechless. Kill me, he said, that you may be rewarded, and I have rest. For so you will be fighters for the faith, and I a martyr. It is easy to see how the way was prepared for this high thought by the Mithra worship of Persia, and therefore how in one sense it derived directly from the Indian Veda, of which Mithra was a recognized deity. Even the close and almost passionate devotion which existed between teacher and pupil in India persists in Persia and in Sufism. That worship of Mithra the sun god, the soldier, the beautiful, might at one time easily have become the worship of Europe. 
Europe indeed trembled in the balance between Christ and Mithra, but the former was to conquer and the latter to divide into many fertilizing streams of thought. One of these tinctured Sufism, which in its turn gave to Mohammedanism a spirit and inspiration that it had lacked in the harsh realities and fatalism of the often noble teachings of Muhammad. I give a specimen of the passion that broke on India from Persian Sufis, kindling a new fire in literature and music and affecting the devotion to the native gods in no small degree. This, though an Indian song and with purely Indian music, is a flower from the root of the Persian ecstasy. I am mad for my beloved. They say, what say they? Let them say what they will. It concerns me not. Whether they are pleased or angry, may one only be gracious to me. Let them say what they will. The sheik walks round his holy place. I offer myself at thine altar, call it shrine or hovel. They say, what say they? Let them say what they will. I have gazed on the glory of the cheek of my beloved. I am burnt as a moth in the flame. I am as one drunken. They say, what say they? Let them say what they will. Most of all is this seen in the heavenly songs of Kabir, he who wandered through India equally beloved by Hindu and Mohammedan, songs of union, of devotion and adoration so passionate, so tender, that even the colder Western nature is swept by them to the height, where pure radiance dazzles the eyes and the unstruck music is sweeter than all sound. When Kabir died, Hindus and Mohammedans contested the possession of his body, each longing to do honour to the shell that had once contained the bird of God. And at last one lifted the pall, and there lay beneath it only a heap of roses. They divided these, and the Hindus burned theirs into pure ashes, and the followers of Islam buried theirs, that the perfume and colour might pass into the earth to kindle the fire of other such roses, and both were content. In the present day, Rabindranath Tagore carries on the tradition of Kabir and the Sufis, united to the deeper depths and higher heights of the Vedanta. The way of truth is one, said Clement of Alexandria, but into it, as into a never-failing river, flow the streams from all sides. And the Mithraic doctrines of the incarnate word, sacrifice, and above all communion, had prepared the Persian mind for the inspiration of the Sufis, as a way to the highest consciousness, wherein the pearl of the soul is dissolved in the wine of God. Thus, Sufism is another burning light of the great Aryan consciousness in the Orient, and a flame indeed was the philosophy of the Orient. There can be no doubt that the discipline which directed the Eastern will in the direction of the spiritual and idealistic in philosophy and religion gave it a power almost unknown among the Western Aryans and enabled it to breathe in a rarefied atmosphere which they could not endure. Such enthusiasms and inspirations cannot be felt where the religion or philosophy is a foreign one grafted on an alien consciousness and not springing from the root itself. Christianity was an imported faith, and its languor even as a militant impulse may be seen by comparing the Crusades with the fire and fury of an Islamic holy war. Taking another direction, as this force did in India, it permeated and moulded a whole nation, many of them men of lower races, in whom therefore the lower racial characteristics still persist, into a faith and philosophy that but for some of the early native animistic beliefs coloured all India. The rush of that wave was tremendous, and though its fighting strength was the force of the spirit rather than of the sword, there is nothing like it in the history of Europe, where philosophy and faith have rather been decorations than life itself as in the East.